Sisters and brothers, Awe Inosie Me, Pastor Melo speaking. As promised, I will address the answers to the frequently asked questions in order to allow as much as possible to clarify all the gray areas surrounding the mystery of Fatima. The first recurring question is, Where is it written in the Bible that Christ was to come in the flesh a second time? Well, listen. First mention in the Bible of a second coming in the flesh of Christ. The Bible explicitly mentions in Revelation chapter 12, verse 5, a second birth of the Messiah. It even specifies in encrypted form the year of the announcement of this event, 1917, Oracle of the Most High. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain, and she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. We have here two revelations that follow each other. First, childbirth. What childbirth could this be? The answer is verse 5. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. The only person to whom universal reign has been promised by divine right is Christ. This is confirmed in Psalm chapter 2. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Here the text is blindingly clear. 1. The male child is the Most High's son, the son of man. There is no doubt about his identity. He is Christ, the Messiah of his solely. 2. The nations for inheritance. This is the undivided reign of Christ over all the nations. 3. You will break them with the rod of iron. Note that the same expression is used in both passages, Psalm chapter 2, and Revelation chapter 12. The chronological period of this birth is indicated by the seven heads and the ten horns of the red dragon, 17. In other words, 1917. The lady from heaven appeared in Portugal in the month of May, 1917. And the Red Dragon, the Soviet Union, appeared in October of the same year. Only those who have eyes and don't want to see, ears and don't want to hear, will say that this is a mere coincidence. Conclusion Christ was to return in the flesh, that is, to be born of a woman, sometime after the emergence of the Soviet Union. This event, unknown, misunderstood, hidden, but major in mankind history, occurred in 1918 in an overseas province of Portugal. Second biblical mention of Christ's second coming in the flesh. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28. Likewise Christ, who offered himself once to bear the sins of many, will appear without sin a second time, I insist, will appear without sin a second time to those who await him for their salvation. All readers of the Bible and even exegetes who should have a more acute knowledge of the Holy Book confuse this passage with the parousia. The parousia is the manifestation in the glory of Christ that is in a glorious body not subject to sin. However, the author of the above passage gives us a clue that should have alerted all diligent students of the Holy Book. Will appear without sin. 
Now let's read Romans chapter 8 verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God standing his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Since it is clear that the body is subject to sin, is that made of flesh, corruptible, tainted with the vice which leads to death. The specification that Christ will appear without sin means that he will be in the flesh, but that, as in his first coming 2,000 years ago, sin will have no hold on him. It should be noted that Christ, during his presence on earth reported in the Gospels, had only accomplished part of the mission which was his. The first part of his mission was the spiritual deliverance of mankind from the stains of sin, whose inevitable consequence is death. This work was accomplished on the Calvary of Golgotha. This is why Paul exclaimed, Death has been swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 54 to 55. It must be understood that this part concerning spiritual salvation was incomprehensible by all. Even Christ's disciples did not understand. It took time a long time before, thanks in particular to the teachings of Paul, the contemporaries of Christ began to understand the significance of the sacrifice made by the Son of Man on the cross. Therefore, it is an understatement to say that the, that the crowd who cried out for the death of Christ had understood nothing of it. What this crowd wanted was the fall of Roman colonialism, which, not content with exploiting the riches of their ancestral land, wanted to impose abominable beliefs on the Holy Land, the first being the adoration as God of the distant Roman emperor. Apart from a few entities such as King Herod and his dynasty, who agreed to collaborate with Rome, all those who were called Jews had a deep hatred against the foreign invaders who were crushing them under their boots. Therefore, Christ's death on the cross, followed by his resurrection from the dead, was Christ's first victory over the principalities, the rulers of the darkness of this world, the spiritual wickedness in high places. So was accomplished the first part of the Messiah's mission. We must understand here that the second part of his earthly mission remained to be accomplished. What mission? Let's listen to the Bible. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 19. Let's start with the last part of this prophecy. What is the year of favor announced by Christ 2,000 years ago? No matter how much you search the Bible and the annals of history, you will not find anything that refers to this year of grace when the oppressed are set free according to the above text matching the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 61. So, if this year of grace, proclaiming liberty to captives and deliverance to prisoners, did not exist during the first passage of Christ on earth, this simply means that there is a hole in the curriculum vitae of the Lord. Please forgive me this familiar expression. This hole could only be filled during a second earthly passage of Christ, which is noted by the author of the epistle to the Hebrews, who underlines this particularity that during his second coming, 
Christ would not come for everyone, but only for those who were waiting him to set them free. I repeat, Christ would not come for everyone, but only for those who were waiting him to set them free. In other words, the lost sheep of the house of his solely. As I had the opportunity to underline in my book 20 by 20, Dry Bones Get Up, this year of grace is year 1960, which in all history books symbolizes freedom for the meek of this world, the African people in particular. It also was to be the year of the revelation of the great secret of Fatima by the Vatican. It took a supreme, suprahuman power to break the chains of oppression and slavery in which the tribes of Isolele were held captive and by extension the peoples of the continent of origin of all humanity. The one who succeeded in breaking this yoke is none other than the Messiah announced at Fatima, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 2 to 3. Third mention in the Bible of a second coming in the flesh of Christ. The reference to chapter 53 of the prophet Isaiah also allows us to give the third irrefutable proof of a second coming of Christ in the flesh. It is enough to see the millions of works of art devoted to the physical aspect of the Son of Man, always, with few exceptions, portrayed as perfectly beautiful, only to realize that there is a problem. Does not the prophet, in the only account physically describing the Messiah of Isolele, heavily insist that he had no beauty or majesty to attract the eye, refer to the first three verses of chapter 53. And, and in the stageable, in chapter 52, the prophet goes even further by pointing out that the Son of Man would be a subject of dread, his face being disfigured naturally and not as a result of some punctual torture as generally implied by the exegetes of the Bible. How did the so-called Bible scholars fail to realize that if the Lamb of God, John chapter 1 verse 29, the Passover Lamb who takes away the sins of the world were disfigured, he would have been automatically unfit for sacrifice. Let the Torah speak in this regard. Speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the Israelites and say to them, If any of you, whether an Israelite or a foreigner residing in Israel, presents a gift for a burnt offering to the Lord, either to fulfill a vow, or as a free will offering, you must present a mare without defect from the cattle, sheep, or gods, in order that it may be accepted on your behalf. Do not bring anything with a defect, because it will not be accepted on your behalf. Leviticus chapter 22, verse 18 to 20. So this disfigured face of Christ is anachronistic. That is to say that it doesn't correspond to the reference period of 2,000 years ago, but to a time when the Son of Man would have returned on earth to meet once again with human opprobrium and ingratitude, this being the condition experienced by any black African at that particular time. Fourth mention in the Bible of a second coming in the flesh of Christ. The fourth compelling argument proving a second coming in the flesh of Christ is found in Luke chapter 17 verse 27. Where the body is, there the eagles will be gathered. Christ being the center of the biblical story, there's no need for the evangelist author of this text to specify to whom the body in question belongs. It is indeed the body of Christ, which again is in stark contrast to the story of the Messiah 2,000 years ago. 
Indeed, as everyone knows, he was resurrected and he ascended to heaven with his body. Empty was Christ's tomb in Jerusalem, empty it has remained to this day. God said the mention of the body of Christ in the end times, in the form of a corpse, as the scriptures suggest, is further proof of a second coming of Christ in the flesh, a second coming during which he would have lived in appearance at least a banal normal life whose term would have been a natural death resulting in a funeral and a burial site visible for everyone. This is what happened during the death on December 31, 1983 of the men of Fatima in Luanda, capital city of Angola, and his burial in Taya, Makela do Zombo, in northern Angola on January 10, 1984. There exist other texts, other biblical arguments establishing indisputably a secret second coming. I emphasize the word secret of Christ on earth, notably Isaiah chapter 42. But I believe that what I have presented here are enough facts to sweep away any doubt about it at least for those who will believe. As for the incredulous, the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 12, verses 11 to 14 will be fulfilled. Ingeta Pastor Melo. Gele kwata tangeli baka ngolo zampa.